Welcome to this online lesson on rapid fire. What was the effect of bolt action and automatic weapons? This lesson will focus on the development of weapons towards the end of the 19th century. Industrialised warfare that would later play a significant role at the start of the 20th, specifically the First World War. But let's find out some key words first. In Cloak's compendium of annoying old-fashioned words that you need to know today are Magazine, a container for bullets and a gun. Originally a magazine was the area of a ship or a fortress where the ammunition was kept. Bolt action, a rifle that can fire multiple bullets by working a mechanism. This mechanism looks a little bit like the bolts you might find on a gate lock. Automatic, machine guns, the gun that keeps firing one bullet after the other while the trigger is held. Your tasks, then, are to record the key words. And secondly, how are these innovations superior to earlier weapons, such as muzzle-loading and breech-loading single shotguns that we may have looked at in previous lessons? Pause the video now and record the key terms. Done? OK, let's have a look at the first innovation. The story so far. What developments in weapons had already happened? Well, in terms of firearms, our earliest weapons tended to be things like matchlock muskets, where the gunpowder was set off with a burning match. Then flintlock muskets, which were both safer, quicker and more easy to use, as well as being more reliable. Then there was cartridge ammunition, which speeded up and simplified the loading procedure. Then rifling, that made guns further firing and more accurate. And finally breech loading, where the cartridge and bullet could be loaded into the back of the gun even more quickly and safely than before, rather than down the muzzle of the gun. The next big change was the magazine rifle. A typical magazine rifle is shown here, the British Army's Lee Enfield. I believe that this is a number one Mark III variant. This is what's called a bolt action rifle. The box by the trigger guard is the magazine. On the Lee Enfield this could hold ten bullets, although it was more typical around the world for these magazines to hold five. The bolt action on top could be worked as a mechanism to not only load the next bullet, but to eject the previous one. And then, only when all the bullets in the magazine were fired, would the gun actually need to be reloaded, and even then, quite simply, at the breech. So, the magazine rifle could fire quickly and accurately, hold multiple bullets in a magazine, typically between 5 and 10 bullets at a time, be reloaded quickly with a bolt action, sometimes this is called a repeating mechanism, as a task then, explain the advantages of the bolt-action magazine rifle over earlier guns. If you want to do that, press pause now. Done? Well, hopefully we've recognised that firing accurately is no different to the rifles, although it happens that these became more and more accurate as time went on. The crucial difference is that it can hold so many bullets at a given time and fire them comparatively so quickly. I've included in the description a link to a video of the Lee Enfield in action. This is shown by uh, the late R. Lee Ermey, who is a former US Marine. Um, Ermey's style might not be to everyone's taste, and certainly the rather cringeworthy British guy who, borrow, uh, who joins them is even worse. Nevertheless, this video gives a pretty good uh, lowdown on how a bolt-action rifle works and the effectiveness of the Lee Enfield in particular as a bolt-action rifle. So do give it a watch if you want to have a little bit more detail on what these rifles were like. Other than that, we'll move on to our next development. Let's have a look at a specific example and the introduction and power of bolt-action rifles when they were introduced to the British Army. In the 1880s, the British introduced the Lee Metford rifle. This would eventually evolve into the legendary series of Lee Enfield rifles that served the British Army from around 1900 to 1950. That's a testament to the power and accuracy and the reliability of this design. Yes, it had a few modifications along the way, but essentially it was the same weapon in service for over 50 years. Some key details about the Lee Enfield rifle. It had a met range of over 1,500 metres, although admittedly with traditional sights it was difficult to acquire a target at that sort of range. It had 10 bullets in the magazine, and it was able to fire 20 aim shots in a minute, although as we'll see, British soldiers were occasionally able to fire more than this in what was called the Mad Minute, but how much this was actually trained for remains open to some debate. We're going to do some numeracy-based activities now in order to get a sense of the firepower of the Lee Enfield rifle in trained hands. Okay, get your maths brains on in gear for this. 
British soldiers were famed for their rate of fire and accuracy. In World War I, German soldiers complained of facing machine guns, when in fact they were facing rapid fire from Lee Enfields. Work out the following to get an idea of the firepower of the Lee Enfield. Firstly, the, uh, the earlier Martini Henry, which was a breech loading rifle, fired around five shots in a minute. A platoon of 30 so soldiers with Lee Enfields was equivalent to how many with Martini Henrys. Secondly, a British soldier typically carried 150 bullets. How quickly could they fire all their ammunition? And thirdly, British soldiers were trained to do a mad minute of 30 shots a minute. They could only do this for one minute at a time before firing at a more steady 20 shots a minute for the next minute. How quickly could a soldier fire all 150 bullets if they shot alternating mad minutes of 30 shots with normal firing of 20 shots? Pause the video now and then we'll go through some answers. OK, how did you get on? Well, the purpose of doing a bit of a numeracy activity is not just to practice that skill, but it's also to appreciate just how much more powerful the, the bolt-action rifle was compared to earlier weapons like the Martini Henry and indeed the muzzle loaders of the 1850s and the Crimean War. For question one, well, consider this. A platoon of 30 soldiers, each of them firing 20 aimed shots in a minute, means that we have to times 20 by 30. We then divide that by 5 to get our answer, which is equivalent to 120 soldiers with Martini Henrys. So a platoon of 30 soldiers with Lee Enfields would have been equivalent to 120 soldiers with Martini Henrys. A British soldier typically carried 150 bullets. How quickly could they fire all of their ammunition? Well, at a steady rate, it would be 120 divided by 20, 150, sorry, divided by 20, which should give us seven and a half minutes as our answer. And then finally, British soldiers were trained to do a mad minute of 30 shots a minute. How long could they do this while alternating with more steady firing? Well, a set of 30 mad minute shots and a set of 20 normal firing shots equals 50. And they'd achieve that in just two minutes. So 3 times 50 equals 150, meaning that a British soldier alternating between mad minutes and steady firing could loose off all 150 rounds of ammunition in 6 minutes. Although, of course, this would be rather unwise if you were going to be in a battle that would last rather longer than that. Still, we can see how much more powerful and how much more useful the Lee Enfield was compared to earlier weapons, especially with good training. Let's look at another development now. The birth of the machine gun. A reminder of the key words. A magazine is a container for bullets in a gun. A bolt action is a rifle that can fire multiple bullets by working a mechanism. And an automatic gun is a machine gun. The gun that keeps firing one bullet after the other while the trigger is held. In the 1860s, in time for the American Civil War, a literally revolutionary weapon was introduced. The Gatling gun. This had a one mile range. It fired 200 shots in a minute, or faster if the crank was turned quickly. And that brings me on to the last point. It was fired by turning a crank. A typical Gatling gun of the 1860s is shown in the photograph on the right. Notice that it's got a crank at the back, which looks like a little handle next to the brass casing. Its magazine is top loading and can be seen on top of that brass casting. The other most obvious thing about it is that it's got these multiple barrels. That's what makes it literally revolutionary. Those barrels spin. But why go to such effort? Well, the answer is a question of friction. When a bullet is fired down a barrel, especially a rifled barrel like this, it creates a lot of friction and therefore can heat up the gun barrels very quickly. By only firing one barrel at a time in a rotary motion, the barrels have a chance to cool down before being fired again. This is a very reliable system when used correctly and it prevents the gun barrels wearing out and splitting. A clever design. And that's, that spinning me um, measure is also why I said that this was a literally revolutionary weapon. We're going to do one more mass activity now when considering the firepower, firepower of the Gatling gun. Your task then. A typical American Civil War soldier could fire three shots a minute using their, their uh, muzzle-loading um, musket rifles. One Gatling gun was equivalent to how many normal soldiers? Round up to the nearest whole number. Secondly, review the key words. Why is the Gatling gun not an automatic weapon? If you need to review the key words, they're just down there on the right. OK, pause the video. Once you've worked that out, press play and we'll see what the answers are. Pause now.
Right, what did we identify? Well, hopefully we worked out this. If you divide 200 by 3, that gives you the number of normal soldiers that one Gatling gun was equivalent to. And that is 66.6 .6 recurring. Now, because 0.6 of a soldier is not much use because it sounds like most of his arms have been blown off, you've got to round it up to the nearest soldier. Uh, so the nearest whole soldier. So that would be 67 soldiers. Pretty good. Having reviewed the key words, we should have identified that the Gatling gun is not a true machine gun because it is not truly automatic. It doesn't have a trigger that you simply hold down and then it keeps on reloading itself. You have to manually reload it because that cranking mechanism revolves the barrels, ejects the spent cartridges and loads a new one and fires them. So that cranking motion is manual. It's a lot like a machine gun, but it's not quite a true machine gun. Which brings us on to our next development. Oh, I forgot to mention, you might recognise Gatling guns even from modern warfare. Indeed, they still exist and they're still in quite wide use, but they're not quite the same as their elderly counterparts. These days, Gatling guns are not fired by turning a hand crank, but by spinning an electric motor, and they're regularly used in aircraft, as seen here. This is the GAU-8 Avenger gun, as fitted to the A-10 Thunderbolt tank-busting ground-attack aircraft of modern times. That's a Gatling gun in the front, front. just recognise the features. It's got the multiple barrels. It spins when it fires its ammunition. But this is not firing rifle-sized ammunition anymore. This is, this is firing 30mm shells, which can bust tank armour. And it's not firing 200 shots in a minute. This thing can fire up to 3,000 shots in a minute. Pretty uh, substantial stuff. Anyway, it just shows you how a good idea can be very long-lived. Speaking of which, let's have a look at the first true machine gun. Now we consider the birth of the machine gun proper. In the 1880s, the first truly automatic machine gun was invented by Hiram Maxim. He's the chap with the beard in the photograph at the top. The Maxim gun would form the basis of all the major machine guns used by all nations in World War I. It is thought that the machine gun is the deadliest man-made invention ever. A pretty sobering thought. And consider that even today, certain machine guns still use the basic Maxim principle. It had a range of two miles, and it could fire 500 shots a minute. And with refinement, Maxim-based guns were reaching up to 800 shots a minute by the end of World War I. Your tasks, then. Use your answers from earlier in the lesson. One Maxim gun was equivalent to how many soldiers armed with Lee-Enfield rifles. And then, what might be the practical disadvantages of using weapons with such high rates of fire? And then just for fun, why might a soldier's pee help them use this gun? OK, pause the video here and have a go. Right, how did you get on? Well, consider that a British soldier of the First World War ordinarily shot about 20 shots a minute with his Lee Enfield. So, if you take 500 shots a minute and then divide that by 20, you get 25. So, roughly one Maxim gun is equal to the firepower of 25 regular soldiers. So that's one machine gun giving the firepower of almost a platoon of soldiers. Pretty scary stuff. But the disadvantages of using this is that these machine guns could use up ammunition so quickly it was quite easy to run out. So supplying them was quite a challenge. And lastly, how might a soldier's pee help them? Well, look at the size of that jacket around the gun barrel. The gun barrel is very, very thin. Remember the friction and the heat caused by the bullets passing down there. 500 shots a minute is going to create an immense amount of heat, and the gun barrel will simply burst. Well, this was Maxim's genius idea, aside from his very reliable mechanism. The jacket around the outside of the, uh, of the barrel is filled with water. Therefore, think of the science here. If the gun barrel becomes hot, it will heat up that water that's around it. Now, that water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius, and the steel of the gun barrel is not going to melt or even be damaged at 100 degrees Celsius. The only way that one of these guns can truly overheat through use is in a couple of ways. Firstly, if that water boils off, and secondly, if the gun barrel itself becomes worn out. But that would take a huge amount of extra, uh, of extra firing. So how does a soldier's pee help them use this gun? Well, it was not unknown for soldiers who are running short on water to use their urine to top up their water jackets. The pee would boil instead of the water. It worked, so why not? If you want to know more about the First World War versions of the Maxim guns, I've included in the description a video, thankfully not with the, uh, the annoying American guy this time, uh, who's, uh, of Dan Snow having a look at First World War machine guns. 
The last one, the Lewis gun, is rather different to the Maxim gun, but you can still watch it out of interest. But it really does make the point that both the German pr principal heavy machine gun and the British heavy machine gun, the Vickers, were both based upon the same Maxim design. OK, let's move on. So what was the result of all this extra firepower? Britain had an early taste of modern weaponry, suffering some humiliating defeats in the Boer War of 1899 to 1902. But they made some crucial changes, not only to win that war eventually, but they made them in time for World War I. However, the recipe for military stalemate was now in place, where neither side could win. Defensive weapons and technology, like machine guns, barbed wire, heavy artillery and others had developed a lot further than offensive or attacking weapons like rifles and bayonets, and indeed in the First World War things like grenades. As a task then, explain in your own words why machine guns were so powerful as defensive weapons. Remember that early machine guns couldn't really be carried around by individual soldiers. Secondly, consider the effects of fast firing rifles and machine guns. How might they a allow armies to employ fewer soldiers and therefore be smaller? But also, how might they also ensure that armies had to be large? And as a hint, attacking machine guns was very difficult. Pause the video and consider those questions now. Done? Well, have a think about this as well. Do you consider the machine gun an evil weapon? That's not really got a right or wrong answer, but let's consider some of the others. In your own words, why are machine guns so powerful? Well, remember they're defensive weapons because they're so heavy they can't really be carried around by individual soldiers, but that means a small gun crew can lay down so much fire that it would replace many, many other soldiers. If you take the example of the British Vickers gun firing at 500 rounds per minute, that's the equivalent of a whole platoon of soldiers. Then for part two, it may allow armies to employ fewer professional soldiers and be smaller, but actually the reality is rather different. It actually ensured that armies had to be large. In order to attack such strong defences, you need to hurl an awful lot of men at these machine guns. Unfortunately, they were effectively cannon fodder, and many of them would pay the ultimate price. Let's have a little bit more at the lessons learnt from this. Here we see two soldiers from the start of the First World War. On the left, we see an early First World War British soldier wearing the webbing that was adopted after the Boer War with his Lee Enfield rifle slung over his shoulder. Notice that his uniform is what we call khaki, which comes from an Indian word meaning dust. It is effectively the British Army's first camouflage um, uh, uniform that was adopted for all soldiers of all ranks. He wears a cloth cap. Still, helmets are yet to be adopted. Then compare that to the soldier on the right. This is a French soldier. He holds a standard issue Lebel rifle with a, a spiked bayonet on the end. This is a perfectly capable rifle, there's nothing wrong with it. But the French soldier lacks some of the refinements of the, the, the British, his British counterpart, the French having not taken part in a more recent war like the Boer War and learned these lessons. Perhaps most notably is his uniform. A nice heavy coat, sure. But those red trousers, they might look good on parade, but they're hardly going to hide you in the mud and blood of the first battles of the First World War. It's no wonder that the French went for a much lighter blue uniform overall later in that conflict. So, what are the takeaways from this? Firstly, firepower increased dramatically from 1850 to 1914 because of magazine bolt-action rifles and the introduction of automatic weapons, machine guns. Secondly, war got deadlier. And so thirdly, armies, as a consequence, got bigger. Well, at least they did in most nations. The British Army continued with its policy of having a very small but well-equipped and professional army in preference to having a very large army. They instead were relying on the Royal Navy to defend Britain. That decision was going to have some pretty dire consequences at the start of World War I. But that's a lesson for another presentation and indeed another lesson. I hope that that's all been useful to you. Remember, you can check out the links in the description to watch those extra videos. And if that has been useful to you, please give this video a like and consider subscribing to this channel where there'll be more lessons and more GCC help to come. Thanks very much for watching and goodbye.